Hello and welcome to another Atypical Philosopher video with myself Jonathan M. S. Pierce. Today I'm going to speak to you about politics and religion and those two big ideas intersecting in the context of Northern Ireland and the news that came out today that the statistics from this 2021 census show that there are now more Catholics in Northern Ireland than Protestants. And what this entails or what what the ramifications for this are. Now, to give you a bit of context first, let's have a look at the UK, United Kingdom, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. We have a union of countries where we have England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, all making up sort of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, the United Kingdom. And this has, uh, we've been living fairly in a unified fashion for a hundred years apart from the issues in Northern Ireland so what happened in Northern Ireland uh, just to I, I'm going to be quoting from this this article in a second but um, uh, the data on religious background a stark contrast of the state's foundation in 1921 when Britain cleaved six counties from the rest of Ireland to create an entity with a two-thirds Protestant majority comes at a fraught time for unionism okay so there was a two-thirds Protestant majority and what this led to was this idea, this kind of quote that you sometimes hear is a Protestant parliament for Protestant people. OK, a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. Now, that's actually a bastardized version of the actual quote uh, from unionist leaders. So unionists are people who want the union to remain uh, United Kingdom. Republicans uh, want reunification of Northern Ireland with Southern Ireland. So uh, James Craig, a unionist leader from many years back, uh, the, his biographer said, actually, th this isn't quite what you say. Craig is recorded as saying that Southerners had boasted and still, quote, still boast of Southern Ireland being a Catholic state. All I boast of is that we are a Protestant parliament and a Protestant state. And that got bastardized into being a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. Uh, but it's not quite what he said. But either way, the idea is that Northern Ireland uh, remains pro-UK on account of having a majority Protestant population. What has happened over the last few decades is Sinn Féin, the political party that uh, operate, the Republican political party that operates in Northern Ireland, has been gaining popularity and uh, politicians. They don't sit in Westminster. They refuse to sit in Westminster in the Houses of Parliament, but they are so uh, they essentially abstain from an awful, awful lot of sort of voting and whatnot, but they are uh, elected members of, of of Parliament in Northern Ireland, and there are more of them than there used to be. And the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party, has been on the retreat uh, because, uh, partly because, we might argue, there's a democratic demographic shift, as well as people mellowing about their sense of national identity. And I'm going to discuss both of those things right now. So what has happened? OK, let's read a little bit of this article. Catholics outnumber Protestants in Northern Ireland for the first time. Um, uh, so Catholics outnumber Protestants in Northern Ireland for the first time, a demographic milestone for a state that was designed a century ago to have a permanent Protestant majority. OK, so that's really important. So in other words, the state has its own identity as a state depends on its Protestant majority. So results from the 2021 census released on Thursday showed that 45.7% of inhabitants are Catholic or have from a Catholic background, compared with 43.48% from Protestant or other Christian backgrounds. The 2011 census figures were 45% Catholic and 48% Protestant. So a bit of a, a switch around there. Neither block is a majority. The demographic tilt was expected but will still deliver a psychological hit to unionists who for decades relied on a supposedly impregnable Protestant majority to safeguard Northern Ireland's position in the UK. So what this says is that there are now more Catholics and Protestants, and if more Catholics are likely to vote Catholics are more likely to vote for Sinn Féin and be Republican, then you'll have a Republican majority, which in which case, or not the largest proportion will be will be Catholic and Republican. And if they can gain a majority of people who would vote for uh, sort of reunification, then that's that might well happen. 
And this demographic shift looks to be underpinning um, a political shift. So that's a real problem for the unions and a real problem for the UK. OK, so let's rewind a little bit. Well, let's go back to the Scottish uh, independence vote. I think, was that 2014 or before? But the Scottish were granted a, a referendum on, on their independence by David Cameron. Um, and what happened is that the, the, uh, there was a 45%, 55% vote. 55% uh, of Scotland voted to say no to independence and to remain part of the UK. Um, and what has happened since then has been actually people are shifting towards uh, an independence uh, view. And this has been brought about largely or helped largely by that's the question whether actually Brexit made it come about or just acted as a catalyst but brexit in 2016 f shoved a lot of scottish people who were originally unionist or, or no to independence to the independence camp because a lot of people in scotland scotland voted to remain in the uk okay as as a region or as a, as a nation uh, voted to to remain in the eu sorry and um in and England and Wales voted to leave the EU and Northern Ireland voted to remain in the EU. But of course, the populations of Northern Ireland and, and Scotland, uh, Scotland's about 5 million, Northern Ireland, what, 1.9 million, are far less than the 70, you know, the 70 million total. The England and Wales far, far um you know, outweigh the votes of, of Scotland and Northern Ireland. So we, as a nation, as a UK, voted to leave the EU. This has created a lot of resentment in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Now, why is this a particular problem in Northern Ireland? Well, let me show you. So Ireland is still part of uh, the EU, which means they have free movement of... So before, before the Brexit vote, before we left the EU, people could come into Ireland and the UK from all over Europe and they didn't need a passport you just you there's free movement of people so people can move across the Northern Ireland Southern Ireland Irish border but also from Ireland to the UK and from the rest of Europe to the UK but since we've come out of the EU we now have to have hard borders and border checks and passport checks and we need to check goods and services or goods as they come into and leave the country now, the peace agreement in Northern Ireland, the Good Friday peace agreement that, that was, you know, took an awful lot of effort to, to obtain, stipulates that there can't really be a hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. It will cause, it will, it will enable troubles to take place. If you put a hard border there, you're going to have border checks, you're going to have military, you're going to, this is, this is not going to help the Northern Ireland peace process. And so therefore, the stipulation is you can't have a hard border there. OK, so the EU, leaving the EU already is creating a huge problem. We knew this before, but Leave was like, oh, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And then we came to leave the EU and Leave was like, oh my goodness, this really is a problem. Well, yeah, we did tell you that, but you said it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And it turns out it's not fine. So there needs to be a hard border between the UK and the EU. But there can't be a hard border between Northern Ireland and the EU or Northern Ireland and Ireland. Oh dear. So what the, there's been this Northern Ireland protocol. Basically, there's there's a, a sea border now between our own Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. And this has meant that the Northern Ireland can continue to do have frictionless trade and movement of people between Northern and Southern Ireland. Uh, but then, of course that there's an issue because it effectively means that Northern Ireland is still in the EU to all intents and purposes but we're out of the EU this is causing a right old headache and and but this is you know Brexit and Tories and what how they how they've tried to solve it you've got Biden coming in Joe Biden talking about the Good Friday peace agreement you're talking about you know uh, the EU situation and America aren't rushing to do a deal so Jacob Rees-Mogg last night on TV, the the caricature of of Victorian Eton posh boy, 
um, came on onto Newsnight last night and was talking about, well, it's not our fault that America don't want to do a deal with it. But you promised, hang on, you promised that there was going to be a deal with America after we left the EU. Yeah, but um, the last president was up for that, i.e. Trump, but not this one. Hey, hang on, don't blame another country for a trade deal that you promised. Don't don't blame. It's absolutely outrageous, and it's like trying to shift the blame on other people. No, we are the ones that left the EU. It's on us to do the trade deals, and if you can't fulfil those promises, that's on you. That's not on Joe Biden. That's on you, Jacob Rees-Mogg, and that's on you, Brexiteers. So, and this makes me super angry because we saw this coming. Everyone, would, this was always going to be a problem. No, it won't be a problem. No, it won't be a problem. Oh, it's a massive problem. And this just really annoys me. Anyway, so Brexit arguably were the opening nails in the coffin of the UK because that signalled that, uh, that, well, that brought about tensions between people in Northern Ireland uh, and in Scotland as to, you know, where they wanted to be. Did they want to be in the UK or did they want to be in the EU? What offers greater um, economic stability and economic future? Little England or bigger EU. And and so therefore, the Brexit started this ball rolling. And now with this demographic shift that we are seeing, um, we have, you know, further, further nails in the coffin of the, of the UK. And it's not only about um, religion, it's about national identity. Now in the census, in, in the census in all over the UK, we have the question of what do you see? As, and this is not just a census, it's a labour force survey, labour market survey, loads of other Office for National Statistics surveys. Ask the question, do you see yourself, and you can answer multiply. So do you see yourself as British, English, you know, Welsh, Scottish, British, other? And you can answer English and British, Scottish and British. You can even say Scottish, English and British. It, maybe you've got mixed parent, parentage. Um, and in Northern Ireland, you can say British, Northern Irish, and Irish. You can say all those things if that's what you believe you are, the elements of those. What There has been an interesting demographic shift in terms of, or an interesting shift in, in, in ideas of identity over the last sort of 40 years. You look at the 1966 World Cup final, uh, England playing Germany in Wembley. Right, and you see all those Union flags flying, and you don't see any St George's flags, the the red cross on a white background that is now a flag of England, right? Because it wasn't really a thing. We we were it was much more about Britain and England. You know, when we were showing our English national identity, we were doing it through the Union flag, which is all, all covers all the, all the nations of the United Kingdom. Nowadays, people are far more likely to say one, they are English, and two, to to fly. Uh, St George's Cross rather than the Union flag. It's just way more likely. And what we've done is we've shrunk into our localised national identities more and we see ourselves as English as opposed to British or Scottish as opposed to British or Welsh as opposed to British or Northern Irish as opposed to British. And this is what the the census has also shown. So as the, um, the Guardian article continues, however, the census, the census, the first since Brexit, showed a loosening of British identity. Some 31.86% identified as British only. So about a th just under a third see themselves as British. 29.13% identified as Irish only. So almost a third as Irish, not British, not Northern Irish, but Irish. Okay, uh, and so you've got a third and a third, and it's this other group. Uh, and 19.7 only, uh, sorry, 19.78% as Northern Irish only. Okay, so you've got about 20% see themselves as just Northern Irish. Does that mean British? Well, they haven't said British. Does it mean Irish? They haven't said Irish. So what kind of what does that mean? And where would they vote if it came to unification? Uh, and then you have the leftover people who are going to be all three or two of those or whatever. Uh, the census published by the Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency also showed Northern Ireland with its highest population, 1.9 million people, a 5% increase from 2011. It is ageing with the number of people over 65 increasing by nearly a quarter, 25%. Um, uh, a post-Brexit Irish seaboarder 
has put trade barriers between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. So this is Great Britain. This is known as Great Britain. And this is Northern Ireland. You'd say Great Britain and Northern Ireland altogether is, is the UK. So there's a trade barrier between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Um, in May's assembly election, Sinn Féin overtook the Democratic Unionist Party as Northern Ireland's largest party. So the Republicans are the largest party elected in Northern Ireland, boosting its calls for a referendum on Irish unity. Duncan Morrow, a, politi a politics professor at Ulster University, said the state was set up to put a protective ring around Protestants. You can't take away from the symbolic significance of this change. Uh, in a referendum, Northern Ireland's fate may rest with the centrist voters who defy easy political categorisation, with many feeling Northern Irish as opposed to Irish or British, Morrow said. Young people were keenest on Irish unity, he added. It's a ticking clock. So there you go. Um, it, this really does look like it's the end of the UK brought on largely by Brexit and by shifts in the demographics of Northern Ireland to to now uh, see it as predominantly Catholic or at least, you know, Catholics as the largest group uh, and Christian, uh, you know, Protestant Christians and Protestant and other Christians uh, as a smaller group than Catholics. I, the United Kingdom is not long for this world and i think that's really sad it's really sad i am pro union as in i think we're all better together now northern Ireland's really complicated uh and i understand that you know it's a bit like israel going and shoving a whole bunch of people in somewhere where they weren't living before uh and saying that they can make the rules i understand that's hugely problematic uh i like the idea of great britain and northern ireland of the united kingdom but uh, I also respect self-determination. So previously when I was like dead against Scottish people even being able to vote for independence because I thought, you know, no, we've got to fight really hard to keep the union together because it's a better country as a whole and that variety that we have and that mixing, that melting pot is just really, is, is a real benefit. Now I think, well, do you know what? No, I can't deny you your self-determination. If you want to be out of the UK, then that's your right to do that. I think it's a bad idea and I think the, the, we'll be all the worse for it. Uh, but I understand that. and But I understand also that, dagnamit, it's about being wanting to be part of the EU and something bigger than the UK and more beneficial. And so I am dead against leaving the EU and I'm dead against the breakup of the UK. Um, and when Brexiteers say, oh, we, we should be able to vote to leave the EU. Yeah, well, you can't deny Northern Ireland and Scotland getting their vote to leave us then. You can't, on the one hand, say, yeah, let's vote for our self-determination to leave the UK. We want sovereignty. And then turn around to Northern Ireland and Scotland and say, but you can't do that because I'm part of the Conservative and Unionist Party, which is the full name of the party. And I'm a Brexiteer, but I think that you can, the union is is great. You do get some Tory voters now actually being fine with ditching Scotland and Northern Ireland because they've retreated so much into in Little England England mentality that they're fine with that. Um, anyway, that those are my thoughts. It's a death knell for the UK. What are your thoughts? Did I get anything wrong? Um, do you agree? As ever, like, subscribe, um, share. That's wonderful. You can join my uh, growing community of members to become a member of the A Tippling Philosopher channel um, or give your thanks in any other ways or just sort of watch my videos. Uh, it's all really gratefully received. Thank you. Uh, as ever, question everything, particularly yourselves. And until next time, goodbye.